Chapter 4 Helen Bragg's battle was over, and she had lost. The tickets were in her handbag. Their luggage, Mark had made them pack almost all the clothes they owned and paid an outrageous sum for the extra weight, was piled on the baggage cart already wheeled outside onto the concrete, fine snow settling on it. She had lost, and yet 15 minutes before plane time, she still protested, not in the hope that Mark would change his mind. It was simply that she felt miserable and guilty. She said, I still don't think I ought to go. I feel like a deserter. They stood together in the terminal lobby, a tiny island oblivious to the human eddies around them. Her gloved hand held to his arm, her cheek was pressed tightly against his shoulder. He pressed her hand and said, don't be silly. Anybody with any sense gets out of a primary target area at a time like this. You aren't the first to leave, and you won't be the last. That doesn't make it right, and it isn't right. My place is here with you. He pulled her around to face him so that her upturned mouth was inches from his own. That's just it. You can't stay with me. If and when it comes, I'll be in the hole, protected by 50 feet of concrete and steel and good earth. That's where my place is, and that's where you can't be. You'd be somewhere on the surface, exposed. If you could come down into the hole with me, then you could stay, darling. This was something he had not said before, a fact she had not considered. Somehow it made her feel a bit better, and yet she continued to argue, although dispiritedly. Still, I think my job is here. His fingers banded her arm, and when he spoke, his voice was flat, a direct order. Your job is to survive, because if you don't, the children won't. That is your job. There is no other. You understand that, Helen? On the other side of the droughty terminal, Ben Franklin and Peyton buzzed around the newsstand, each with a dollar to spend on candy, gum, and magazines. They knew only that they were getting out of school a week early and were spending Christmas vacation in Florida. That's all Helen had told them. And in the excitement of packing and greeting their father and then packing more bags, there had been no questions. Helen said, I understand. Her head dropped against Mark's chest. If this business blows over, you'll let us come home, won't you? Sure. You promise? Certainly, I promise. Maybe we could be home before the next school term. Don't count on it, darling, but I'll call you every day, and as soon as I think it's safe, I'll give you the word. The loudspeaker announced Flight 714 for Chicago, connecting with flights east and south. The children ran over to them. Peyton carried a quiver and a bow slung over her shoulder, Ben Franklin a cased spinning rod, his Christmas present from Randy the year before. Mark shepherded them outside and toward gate three. He lifted Peyton off the ground and held her a moment and kissed her, disarranging her red-knitted cap. My hair, she said, laughing, and he put her down. He noticed other passengers filtering through the gate. He drew Ben Franklin aside. He said, behave yourself, son. Ben looked up at him, his brown eyes troubled. When he spoke, his voice was intentionally low. This is an evacuation, isn't it, Dad? Yes. It was Mark's policy never to utter an untruth when replying to a question from the children. I knew it was as soon as I got home from school. Usually Mother gets all excited and happy about traveling. Not today. She hated to pack, so I knew it. I hate to send you away, but it's necessary. Looking at Ben Franklin was like looking at a snapshot of himself in an old album. You'll have to be the man of the family for a while. Don't worry about us. We'll be okay in Fort Repose. I'm worried about you. The boy's eyes were filling. Ben Franklin was a child of the atomic age and knowledgeable. I'll be all right in the hole. Not if... Anyway, Dad, you don't have to worry about us, he repeated. Then it was time. Mark walked them to the gate, Peyton's glove in his left hand, Ben Franklin's in his right. Helen turned and he kissed her once and said, Goodbye, darling. I'll phone you tomorrow afternoon. I've got the duty tonight and I'll probably sleep all morning, but I'll call as soon as I get up. She managed to say, Tomorrow. He watched them walk to the plane, a small procession, and out of his life. At nine o'clock, Randy awoke, aware of half a dozen problems accumulated in his subconscious. The problem of transportation he had neglected entirely. He certainly ought to have a reserve of gas and oil. Half his grocery list remained to be purchased. He had not filled Dan Gunn's prescriptions. He had yet to visit Bubba Offenhouse and collect civil defense pamphlets. 
He went into his bathroom, turned on the lights, and washed the sleep out of his eyes. Lights? What would happen if the lights went out? Several boxes of candles, two old-fashioned kerosene lamps, and three flashlights were cached in the sideboard downstairs, a provision against hurricane season. He had a flashlight in his bedroom and in another in the car. He added candles, kerosene, and flashlight batteries to his list. Everything except gasoline would have to wait until tomorrow anyway. With Helen to help him fill the gaps, it would be easy to lay in all the essentials Saturday. He changed his clothes, shivering. The nights were getting cooler. Downstairs, the thermometer read 61, and he turned up the thermostat. The Bragg house had no cellar. They were rare in central Florida. But it did have a furnace room and was efficiently heated by oil. Oil? He doubted that he'd have to worry about oil. The fuel tank had been filled in November, and thus far, the winter had been mild. In the garage, Randy found two empty five-gallon gasoline cans. He put them in the car trunk and drove to town. Jerry Kling's station was still open, but Jerry had already turned off his neon sign and was checking the cash register. Jerry filled the tank and two extra cans, and as an afterthought, Randy asked for a gallon of kerosene and five extra quarts of oil. Driving back on River Road, Randy slowed when he reached the McGovern's. All the lights were on in the McGovern's house. He turned into the driveway. It was 10.30. It was not necessary that he leave for the Orlando airport until 2 a.m., It was near dawn in the eastern Mediterranean when Saratoga, working up speed in the narrowing waters between Cyprus and Lebanon, catapulted four F-11F Tigers, the fastest fighters in its complement. By then, the reconnaissance jet that had shadowed Task Group 6.7 through the darkness hours had vanished from the radar screens. The Admiral's staff was convinced another would take its place, as on the previous morning, but this day the snooper would receive a surprise— Task Group 6.7's primary mission was to take station in the Iskenderan Gulf and give heart to the Turks, who were under heavy political and propaganda pressure. The force's security would be endangered if its perilously tight formation in this confined area was observed. Quite often, the flood of history is undammed or diverted by the character and actions of one man. In this case, the man was not an official in Washington, or the Admiral commanding Task Group 6.7, or even the captain or air group commander of the Saratoga. This man was Ensign James Cobb, nicknamed Peewee, the youngest and smallest pilot in Fighter Squadron 44. Ensign Cobb was assigned combat air patrol duty on this Saturday morning simply because it was his turn. He was scarcely 5 feet 6 inches tall, weighed 124, and looked younger than his 23 years. Under a flat-top haircut, his red head appeared knobby and outsized. His face was pinched and mottled with freckles. In the presence of girls, he was shy to the point of panic. In the wonderful ports of Naples, Nice, and Istanbul, he distinguished himself as the only pilot in the Fighting 44 who never found reason to request a knight's liberty ashore. When he climbed into the cockpit of his aircraft, Pee Wee Cobb's whole character changed. The instant his hands and feet were on the controls, he became as large and as fast as his supersonic fighter and as powerful as its armament. As compensation for outer physical deficiencies, he was gifted with superb reactions and eyesight. He was rated superior in rocketry and gunnery. He got a fierce thrill in pushing his F-11F through the mock and to the limit of its capability. He could outfly anybody in the squadron, including the lieutenant commander who led it and who had once said, Pee-wee may be a mouse aboard ship, but he's a tiger in a tiger. If I sent him up with orders to shoot down the moon, he'd try. Now, for the first time, Pee-wee Cobb was flying CAP under wartime conditions. In a fighter armed with live rockets and with orders to intercept and destroy a snooper if it appeared. Climbing steadily in the darkness, he prayed that if the bogey came back, it would attempt to penetrate his sector. If it did, nobody would laugh at his size, his squeaky voice, his face, or his ineffectual awkwardness with women ever again. Pee-wee Cobb had been given a code name, Sunflower 4, and instructions to orbit over an area of sea off Haifa, astern of Task Group 6.7. If the hostile reconnaissance jet came in from an Egypt in Egypt or Albania, he would be in a position to intercept. His fighter was armed with sidewinders, ingenious, single-minded rockets, heat-seekers. 
A Sidewinder's nose was sensitive to infrared rays from any heat source. Pee-wee had fired two in practice. They not only had destroyed the targets, but had unerringly vanished up the tailpipes of the drones. At 30,000 feet, Pee-wee judged he was on station and called for a radar fix. The missile cruiser Canberra, closest ship in the formation, confirmed his position. As he circled, the sky in the southeast grew light. When the sun touched his wingtips, the sea was still dark below. Then gradually, the shape and color of sea and earth became plain. He felt entirely alone and apart from this transformation, as if he watched from a separate planet. He checked his map. Far to the east, he picked out Mount Carmel and a river, and beyond were the hills of Megiddo, also called Armageddon. He continued to orbit. His earphones crackled, and he acknowledged Saratoga. The fighter controller's voice said, Sunflower 4, we have a bogey. He is at Angels 25 and his speed 500 knots. Your intercept course is 30 degrees. Go get him. So the snooper was already north of him and racing up the coast, hoping to hang on to the flank of the task group and observe it by radar from a position close to friendly Syrian territory. Pee-wee took his heading and pushed his throttle up to 99% power. He slid through the mock with a slight, thrilling tremor. Every 15 or 20 seconds, he made minute alterations in course in response to directions from Saratoga, which was holding both planes on its screens. Then he saw it, flicker of sun on metal, diving at great speed. He pushed the tiger's nose over and followed, reporting, I am closing target. He touched the switch that armed his rockets and another calling for manual fire, singly. The chase had carried him down to 9,000 feet, and the bogey was still losing altitude. It was a two-engine jet, an IL-33, Pee-wee believed, and remarkably fast at this low level. There was no doubt that the bogey knew he was on its tail, for a reconnaissance aircraft would be well-equipped with radar. His speed held steady at Mach 1.5, but his rate of closure slowed. Far ahead, Pee-wee saw the Syrian port of Latakia, reputedly built into an important red submarine base. Within a few seconds, he would be within Syrian territorial waters, and a few more would carry him over the port itself. At this point, Pee-wee should have dropped the chase, for they had already been strictly warned in the briefing against violating anyone's borders. He hung on. In another five seconds, the bogey jinked violently to the right, heading for the port and its anti-aircraft and rocket batteries, and perhaps the sanctuary of an airfield in the brown hills and dunes beyond. Pee-wee turned the F-11F inside him, instantly shortening the range. He pushed the firing button. The sidewinder, leaving a thin pencil mark of smoke, rushed out ahead. For an instant, the sidewinder seemed to be following the flight of the bogey beautifully, and Pee-wee waited for it to merge into the tailpipe of one of the jet engines. Then the sidewinder seemed to waver in its course. Pee-wee believed, although he could not be certain, that the bogey had cut its engines and was in a steep glide. Following the sidewinder, Pee-wee lost sight of the bogey. The sidewinder darted downward toward the dock area of Latakia. It seemed to be chasing a train. That crazy rocket, Pee-wee thought. There was an orange flash and an enormous ball of brown smoke and black bits of debris rushing up to meet him. Pee-wee kicked his rudder hard and climbed away from it, compressed within his G-suit and momentarily losing his vision. Then the shock wave kicked him in the rear, and he was out over the Mediterranean again. He was asking for a vector back to his ship when another flash reflected on his instrument panel. He banked to look back and saw a black cloud, red flames at its base, rising from Latakia. Fifteen minutes after Ensign Cobb, Freckles standing out on his white face like painted splotches, was standing in Admiral's country of Saratoga, trying to explain what had happened. Randy Bragg pulled up in the rear driveway of the McGovern house, wondering whether he should go in. He was not exactly popular with the elder McGoverns, which was why Lib visited him more than he visited her. Whenever he entered the McGovern home, Randy felt as if he were stepping into an enormous department store window. The entire front of the house, facing the Tamuk one, was plate glass clamped between thin stainless steel supports, and every piece of furniture appeared unused, as if a price tag and warranty would be found tied to one of the legs. Lavinia McGovern herself had thought up the basic plan— 
collaborated with the architect, and supervised the construction. The architect, pleading a hotel commission in Miami, had returned part of his fee and absented himself from Fort Repose before the foundation was laid. On his first visit, Randy had not endeared himself to Lavinia. She took him on what she called the Grand Tour, proudly showing off the multiple heat pumps, ensuring constant year-round temperature, the magnificent kitchen with electronic ovens and boilers operated from a central control panel, the cunning round holes in the ceiling which sprayed gentle light on the dining room table, bar, bridge table, and strategically placed abstract statuary. The television screens fared into the walls of the bedroom, living room, dining room, and even the kitchen, and the master bathroom's free-form tub which extended through the wall and into a tiny shielding garden. There were no fireplaces, which she called soot producers, or bookshelves, which were dust catchers. All was new, modern, and functional. When we came down here, Lavinia said, we got rid of everything in Shaker Heights and started fresh, bright, and new. See how I've brought the river right to our feet? She indicated the expanse of glass. What do you think of it? Ranty tried to be at once tactful and truthful. It reminds me of an illustration out of modern living, but, but, Lavinia inquired nervously. Randy, feeling as if he was being helpful, pointed out that in the summer months, the sun's direct rays would pour through the glass walls and that the afternoon heat would become unbearable no matter how large and efficient the air conditioning system. I'm afraid that in the summer you'll have to shutter that whole southwest side of the house, he said. Is there anything else you think is wrong? Lavinia asked, her voice dangerously sweet. Well, yes, that indoor-outdoor bath is charming and original, but come spring, it'll be a freeway for moccasins and water snakes. On cool nights, they'll plop in and swim or crawl right into the house. At this point, Lavinia had squealed and clutched at her throat as if it was suffocating, and her husband and daughter had carried her into the bedroom. The next day, plumbers and masons remodeled the sunken tub, eliminating the outdoor feature. Later, Lib explained that her mother dreaded snakes and had been solely responsible for the design of the house. Randy never felt comfortable in Lavinia's presence thereafter, and Lavinia, while attempting to be gracious, sometimes became pale and grew faint when he appeared. Randy's relations with Bill McGovern were little better. On occasion, after a few extra drinks, he disagreed with Mr. McGovern on matters political, social, and economic. Since Bill, for many years, had been president of a manufacturing concern employing 6,000 people, few of whom ever disagreed with him about anything, he had been affronted and angry. He considered Randy an insolent young loafer, an example of decadence in once what might have been a good family, and a sadly scrambled egghead, and so had informed his daughter. So Randy, sitting in his car, hesitated. He was certain to be coolly received. Lib didn't expect to see him until the next day, and he had a hunch she needed him now. He guessed a considerable argument was going on inside. Lib would be verbally overpowered by her father, and Mark's warning would go unheeded. Randy got out of his car. Lib opened the north door before he could ring. I thought I heard a car in the drive, she said. I'm glad it's you. I've got troubles. Bill McGovern was standing in the living room, wrapped in an ankle-length white bathrobe, smiling as if nothing were funny. Lavinia McGovern, her eyes swollen and pink against pallid skin, lay back on a chaise. She held a handkerchief to her nose. Bill was bald, square-shouldered, and rather tall. His nose was beaked and his chin prominent and strong. In his toga of toweling and with feet encased in leather sandals, he looked like an angry Caesar. So here comes our local Paul Revere, he greeted Randy. What are you trying to do, frighten my wife and daughter to death? Randy regretted having come in, but now that he was in, he saw no point in being anything less than Frank. Mr. McGovern, he said, ordinarily he dressed Lib's father as Bill, you aren't as bright as I thought. If I gave you a hot tip from a good source on the market, you would listen. This is somewhat more important than the market. I thought I was doing you a favor. He turned to leave. Lib touched his arm. Please, Randy, don't go. Elizabeth, when her parents were present, he always called her Elizabeth. I'll leave things the way they are. If you need me, call. 
Lavinia began to sniffle audibly. In a worried voice, Bill said, Now don't rush off half-cocked, Randy. I'm sorry if I was rude. There are certain things you don't understand. Like what? Randy asked. Bill's voice was conciliatory. Just sit down and I'll explain. Randy continued to stand. Now I'm twice as old as you are, Bill said, and I think I know more about what goes on in this world. After all, I know quite a few big men. The biggest. All these war scares are concocted by the Pentagon, no offense meant to your brother, to get more appropriations and give more handouts to Europe and jack up taxes. It's all part of the damnable inflationary pattern that's designed to cheat people on pensions and with fixed incomes and so forth. Now I know your brother thinks he's doing the right thing and I appreciate your telling Elizabeth, but chances are your brother's been taken in too. Have you been listening to the news for the past few days? Yes, oh, I'll admit it looks bad in the Mideast, but that doesn't scare me. We might have a little brush fire war, like Korea, sure, but no atomic war. Nobody's going to use atomic bombs, just like nobody used gas in the last war. You'll guarantee that, eh, Bill? Bill locked his hands behind his back. I can't guarantee it, of course, but only the other day I was talking to Mr. Offenhaus. You must know him. Run civil defense here. Well, he isn't worried. Says the only real danger we face is being overrun by people swarming out of Orlando and Tampa. He doesn't even think there's much chance of that. Fort Repose isn't on any main highway. But he does say we'll have to watch out for the dinges. Keep them under control. Please, Bill, Lavinia said, say darkies. Darkies, hell. The dinges are liable to panic and start looting. Oh, the local... Like Daisy, our cook, and Missouri, the cleaning woman, may be all right. Mr. Offenhouse is talking about the migrant labor, the orange pickers, and so forth. So if Mr. Offenhouse isn't worried, then I'm not worried. Mr. Offenhouse strikes me as a pretty solid businessman. Randy knew that Bubba Offenhouse had been picked to head civil defense because he owned the only two ambulances with which the addition of black scroll work doubled as hearses in Fort Repose. Did you talk to him about fallout? He asked. Well, no, I didn't, Bill said. Mr. Offenhouse said they sent him some booklets from Washington, but he's not passing them around because they're too gruesome. Says, why worry about something you can't see, feel, hear, or smell? Says it's just as bad to frighten people to death as to kill them with radiation, and I must say, I agree with him. Lavinia said, if it came, I suppose we'd have rationing like last time and all kinds of shortages. Bill, don't you think we ought... No, I won't think of it. Please, let's not talk about it any more. It's horrid. She dabbed at her eyes and tried to smile. Randolph, when your sister-in-law comes, won't you bring her over for dinner? Afterwards, we could play bridge. Wouldn't you like to play a rubber now? I know you're going to stay up to meet the plane, and I'm too overwrought to sleep. I'm sure Helen will be delighted to come to dinner, Randy said. As for bridge, I'll take a rain check. I still have some things to do at home. Good night, Lavinia. Sorry I upset you. Lib came out to the car with him. Didn't get very far, did I? He said. You started dad thinking. That's far. Overhead, he heard multi-jet engines. On that night, there were three quarters of the moon. He looked up and see nothing, knew the jets were military aircraft, too high for their running lights to show against the bright sky. On any night, and if you listened for a while, you could hear the B-52s and 47s and 58s, but on this night, there seemed to be more of them. Where are they from? Lib asked. Where are they going? I guess they're from McCoy and McDill and Eglin and Homestead, Randy said, and I don't think they're going anywhere much. They're just stooging around up there because they're safer up there than on the ground. And when you can hear them floating around like that high, you know you're all right. I see, Lib said. For the second time, he kissed her goodnight. When he reached home, it was almost midnight. He made coffee and, yawning, turned on the radio and turned to an Orlando station for the late network news. The first bulletin jerked him wide awake. From Washington, the official Arab radio in a broadcast from Damascus claims that American carrier planes are conducting a violent bombing on the harbor of Latakia. This news broke in Washington just a few moments ago. There has been no reaction from the Pentagon, which at this hour of the night is lightly staffed. However, it is reported that high Navy and Defense Department officials are being summoned into emergency conference. We will give you more on this as we receive it from our Washington newsroom. Here is the text of the official Arab broadcast. 
At about 6.30 o'clock this morning, please remember that it is morning in the Eastern Mediterranean, which is about seven hours ahead of American Eastern Standard Time, low-flying jet aircraft of the type used on United States aircraft carriers and bearing United States insignia brutally and without warning bombed the harbor area of Latakia. It is reported that civilian casualties are high and that many buildings are in flames. That was the text of the Arab broadcast, and that is all the hard news we have at the moment. Latakia is the most important Syrian harbor. Within the last few years, it has been heavily fortified and there has been extensive construction of submarine pens under the direction of Russian technicians. It is generally regarded as one of the most powerful anti-Western naval bases in the Mediterranean. It is known that units of the United States 6th Fleet are now in the Eastern Mediterranean and that these units have been shadowed by fast, unidentified aircraft. The network announcer went on to other news, and Randy's phone rang. He picked it up, irritated. It was Bill McGovern. Did you hear the news? Bill asked. Yes, I'm trying to get more of it. What do you think? I don't think anything yet. I want to hear our side of it. Sounds to me like we're starting a small, preventative war, Bill said. I don't believe that for an instant, Randy said. You don't prevent a war by starting one. Well, we'll see who's right in the morning. Mark Bragg missed the first news flash on Latakia. At that moment, he was straightening up the house before driving to Offutt to assume direction of intelligence analysis in the hull. He had been recalled from the Puerto Rico mission because SAC's commander-in-chief, General Hawker, felt that this newest crisis of senior members of his operations and intelligence staffs should maintain a round-the-clock watch. An attack is rarely planned to conform to a victim's five-day, 40-hour week, so Hawker divided his most experienced officers into three shifts covering the whole day. As SAC's third-ranking intelligence officer, junior to the A2 and his deputy, both brigadiers, Colonel Bragg naturally drew the most onerous hours, midnight to 0800. At 11 p.m. Omaha time, while the Damascus broadcast was being repeated around the world, Mark was in the children's room, feeling like an intruder. It was the silence that discomforted him. He found himself tiptoeing, listening for the missing sounds. The house was as still as northern woods in winter, when all the creatures are gone. Ben Franklin's room looked as if it had been ransacked by a band of monkeys, rather than that a 13-year-old boy had packed. Mark closed dresser drawers and picked up ties, clothes hangers, shoes and socks, never in pairs. He supposed all boys were like that. Peyton's room looked no different than if it had been an ordinary day, as if she had been invited to a slumber party at the home of a friend and would return in the morning. Her bedspread was uncreased, and the furry toy animal that held her pajamas rested precisely in its center, as always. She had forgotten it. Her doll collection, carefully propped up on a tier of shelves, formed a silent audience to his silent inspection. Peyton hadn't asked to take her dolls to Florida. Perhaps she was outgrowing dolls. Or perhaps she didn't realize, when she left them, that it might be forever. Her desk was neat, pencils aligned as if it squads right, school books stacked in a pyramid. He picked up the books and took them downstairs. He would mail them from off it in the morning after he was off duty. Peyton was a tidy and thoughtful little girl, in looks and temperament much like her mother. He loved her. He loved them both. They had been very satisfactory children. The house was intolerably quiet. In the whole house, the only sound was the ticking of clocks. Driving toward Offutt and his job, Mark felt better. When he turned into the four-lane highway that ran south to the base, he saw that it was 11.30 and flipped on the car radio. It was then that he heard the Arab charge that Latakia had been bombed by American planes and, in addition, a rather strange statement from Washington. A Navy Department spokesman, the newscaster said, denies that there has been any intentional attack on the Syrian coast. Mark stepped down on the accelerator and watched the speedometer needle pass 75. On a turn, the back wheels weaved. Ice. He forced himself to concentrate on his driving. Soon he would know everything that was known in the whole, which meant everything that was known to American intelligence and the worldwide news networks everywhere. Meanwhile, it was pointless to guess, or end up in a ditch, a useless casualty with no purple heart. Twelve minutes later, Mark entered the war room, fifty feet underground. Blinking in the brilliant but shadowless artificial sunlight, he glanced at the map panels. Nothing startling. 
He walked on to the offices of A2 Intelligence. In the inner office, Dutch Klein, Deputy A2 and a Buck General in his early 40s, waited for his relief. An electric coffee maker steamed on Dutch's desk. Two ashtrays were filled with crushed cigarette butts. Dutch had been busy. Dutch said, I guess you've heard the news. I caught it on the radio. It's not true, is it? It's fantastic. Dutch touched a sheaf of pink flimsies, decoded priority messages on his desk. Two hours ago, Sixth Fleet scrambled fighters to intercept a jet snooper. An ensign from Saratoga, an ensign, mind you, sighted the bogey and chased him all the way up the Levant. He closed at Latakia and fired a bird. Whether it was human error or an erratic rocket isn't clear. Anyway, everything blew. Dutch, a muscular, keg-shaped man with a round, rubbery face, groaned and sank back into his chair. Automatically, the fortifications of the port area of Latakia came into focus in Mark's mind. Large stores of conventional mines, torpedoes, and ammo, he said. They usually have four to eight subs in the new pens and a couple of cruisers and escort vessels in the harbor. He hesitated, thinking of something else. Worse. The fire and blast could have cooked off nuclear weapons if they were in combat configuration. That could well be. What do you make of it? Worst foul up on record, Dutch said. Glad it's the Navy and not us. I mean, how do you think the Russians will react? Mark asked the question, not because he thought Dutch could give him the answer, but as a catalyst to his own imagination. Intelligence wasn't Dutch's primary interest. On the way up to two stars in command of an air division, Dutch had been forced to assimilate two years of staff, part of his education. To Mark, the intelligence job, with all its political and psychological facets, was a career in of itself. He had a feel for it, the capacity to stir a head full of unrelated facts until they congealed into a pattern arrowing the future. Dutch said, maybe it'll throw them off balance. It might upset their timetable, Mark agreed but I'm afraid they're all set. It might have just given the Kremlin a casus belli, an excuse. Dutch lifted himself out of the chair. I leave it with you. The CNC was in here until a few minutes ago. He said he had to get some sleep because it might be even hairier tomorrow. If there are any important political developments, you're to call him. Operations will handle the alert status as usual. For 30 minutes, Mark concentrated on a pile of flimsies, the latest intelligence from NATO, Smyrna, Naples, the Philippines, Eastern Sea Frontier, and the summaries from Air Defense Command and the CIA. When he was abreast of the situation, he crossed the war room to operations control. The senior controller on duty was Ace Atkins, a former fighter pilot, like Mark, an Eagle Colonel. He was called Ace because he had been one in two wars. Because of proven courage and absolute coolness, he was at the desk now, occupied, with the red phone a few inches from his fingers. One code word into Ace's red phone would cock SAC's 2,000 bombers and start the countdown at the missile sites. It would take another word, spoken by either General Hawker or with his authority, to launch the force. Ace, slight, wiry, looked up and said, Welcome to Bedlam. The control room, separated from the war room by heavy glass, was utterly quiet. Mark said, I'm worried. I wish Washington would come forth with a complete statement. As things stand now, most of the world will believe we attacked Latakia deliberately. Why don't the Navy information people give out? They want to. They've got a release ready. But they're low echelon and you know Washington. Not very well. I know it well, Mark said, and I think I can pretty well guess what's happening. Everybody wants to put his chop on it because it's so important. But for the same reason, nobody wants to take responsibility. The Navy PIO probably called an assistant secretary, and the assistant secretary called the secretary, and the secretary probably called the secretary of defense. By that time, the information agency and state department were involved. By now, more and more people are getting up, and they are calling more and more people. Mark looked at the clocks above the war room maps, telling the time in all zones from Osk to Guam. It's 2 a.m. in Washington now. As each man gives his okay to release, it turns out that somebody else has to be consulted. Eventually, they'll have the Secretary of State out of bed and then the White House press secretary. Maybe he'll wake up the president. Until that happens, I don't think that there will be any full statement. Ace said, my God, that sounds awful. It is, but what worries me most is Moscow. What's Moscow saying? Not a word, not a whisper. 
Usually, Radio Moscow would be screaming bloody murder. That's what worries me. As long as people keep talking, they're not fighting. When Moscow quits talking, I'm afraid they're acting. Mark borrowed a cigarette and lit it. I think the chances are about 60-40, he said, that they've started their countdown. Ace's fingers stroked the red phone. Well, he said, we're as ready as we'll ever be. 14% of the force is airborne now, and another 17% on standby. I'm prepared to hold that ratio until we're relieved at 0800. How's that sound to you, Mark? As always, the responsibility to act lay with A3. Mark Bragg, as A2, could only advise. He said, that's a pretty big effort. You can't keep the whole force in the air and on standby all the time. I know that, and yet, he stretched. I'll trot back to my cave and see what else comes in. I'll check in with you in an hour. On his desk, Mark found copies of three more urgent dispatches. One from the air attaché in Anarka reported Russian aerial reconnaissance over the Azerbaijan frontier. Another from the Navy Department gave a submarine sighting 200 miles off of Seattle, definitely a skunk. The third, received by the State Department from London in the highest secret classification, said Downing Street had authorized the RAF to arm intermediate-range missiles, including the Thor, with nuclear warheads. In an hour, Helen's plane would touch down in Orlando. In two hours, if the plane was on time, Helen and the children would be in an area of relative safety. Mark prayed that for the next two hours, at least, nothing more would happen. He held fast to the thought, so long as there was no war, there was always a chance for peace. As the minutes and hours eroded by and no word came from Moscow, he became more and more certain that a massive strike had been ordered. He diagnosed this negative intelligence as more ominous than almost anything that could have happened, and determined to awaken General Hawker if it persisted. At 3.30 in the morning, Randolph Bragg waited in Orlando's air terminal for Helen's flight. With only a few night coaches scheduled from New York, plus the nonstop from Chicago, the building was almost empty except for sweepers and scrub women. When he saw a plane's landing lights, Randy walked outside to the gate. On the other side of the field, near the military hangars used by Air Sea Rescue Command, he saw silhouettes of B-47s, part of the wing from McCoy, he deduced, using this field in accordance with a dispersal plan. The military hangars and operations building were bright with light, which at this hour was not usual. The big transport came in for its landing, approached on the taxi strip, pivoted to a halt before him, and cut its engines. He saw that only a few people were getting off. Most people would be going on to Miami. He saw Peyton and Ben Franklin come down the steps, Ben incongruously wearing an overcoat, Peyton carrying a bow of quiver of arrows over her shoulder. Then he saw Helen, and she waved and ran out to meet them. Randy rumpled Ben Franklin's hair. The children were both owl-eyed and tired. He leaned over, kissed Peyton, and relieved her of the bow slung over her shoulder. Helen said she's been watching Red Robin Hood. She thinks she's made Marion. Helen was wearing a long cashmere coat and carrying a fur cape over her arm. She appeared fresh, as if starting rather than completing a journey. She was slight. Mark sometimes referred to her as my pocket Venus. Yet Randy was never aware of that except when he saw her completely relaxed. At all times, her body seemed to obey the physical law that kinetic energy increases mass. Her abundant vitality she somehow communicated to others, so that when Helen was present, everyone's blood flowed a little faster, as Randy's did now. She tiptoed to kiss him and said, I feel like ten kinds of a fool, Randy. He said, don't be silly. They walked down toward the terminal. She presented him with a sheaf of baggage checks. Mark made me take everything. We're going to be an awful nuisance. Also, I feel like a coward. You won't when you hear what's just happened in the med. Ben Franklin turned, suddenly awake, and said, What's happened in the med, Randy? Randy looked at Helen inquiringly. She said, It's all right. Both of them knew about it. I didn't realize it until we were on the plane. Children are precocious these days, aren't they? They learn the facts of life before you have a chance to explain anything. While they waited for the luggage, Randy spoke of the news. They listened gravely. Ben Franklin alone commented, Sounds like the kickoff. I guess Dad knew what he was doing. Nothing more was said about it for a time. Randy felt relieved when the suburbs of Orlando were behind them, and with the traffic at thin at this hour, he was holding to a steady 70. 
he thought his apprehension illogical. Why should he be upset by the remark of a 13-year-old boy? When he was sure the children slept in the back seat, he said, They take it calmly, almost as a matter of fact, don't they? Yes, Helen said. You see, all their lives, ever since they've known anything, they've lived under the shadow of war, atomic war. For them, the abnormal has become normal. All their lives, they've heard nothing else, and they expect it. They're conditioned, Randy said. A child of the 19th century would quickly go mad with fear, I think, in the world of today. It must have been pretty wonderful to have lived in the years, say, between 1870 and 1914, when peace was the normal condition, and people really were appalled at the idea of war and believed there'd never be a big one. A big one was impossible, they used to say. It would cost too much. It would disrupt world trade and bankrupt everybody. Even after the First World War, people didn't accept war as normal. They had to call it the war to end war, or we wouldn't have fought it. Helen, what has become of us? Helen, busy tuning the car radio, trying to bring in fresh news, said, You're a bit of idealist, aren't you, Randy? I suppose so. It's been an expensive luxury. Maybe one day I'll get conditioned. I'll accept things like the children. Helen said, Listen, she had brought in a Miami station, and the announcer was saying that the station was remaining on the air through the night to give news of the new crisis. Now we have a bulletin from Washington. He said, the Navy Department has finally released a full statement on the Latakia incident. Earlier today, a Navy carrier-based fighter fired a single air-to-air -air rocket at an unidentified jet plane, which had been shadowing units of the 6th Fleet. This rocket exploded in the harbor area of Latakia. The Navy calls it a regrettable mechanical error. It is possible that this rocket struck an ammunition train and it started a chain explosion, the statement admits. The Navy categorically denies any deliberate bombardment. We will bring you further bulletins as they are received. The Miami station began to broadcast a medley of Second World War patriotic songs, which Randy remembered from boyhood. One was Praise the Lord and Pass the Ammunition. It sounded tinny and in poor taste, but Miami's entertainment usually was in poor taste. Randy said, Do you believe it? Is it possible? Helen didn't answer. She was staring straight ahead as if hypnotized by the headlight's beam, and her lips were moving. He realized that her mind was far away. She had not heard him. Randy had them all in their rooms and asleep by 5.30. He had carried all their luggage, 11 bags, upstairs. He went to his own apartment and collapsed on the studio couch in the living room. Graf jumped up and snuggled under his arm. Almost at once, without bothering to loosen his belt or remove his shoes, Randy slept. It was 0500 at Offutt Field, with Don still more than two hours distant, when General Hawker, unbidden, returned to the hole. The general followed in the tradition of the Vanderburg, Norstad, and LeMay. He received his fourth star while still in his 40s, and now at 50 considered it part of his job that he remained slim and in excellent physical condition. Once warfare, except among the untutored savages, had been fought during the daylight hours. This had changed during the 20th century, until now rockets and aircraft recognized neither darkness nor bad weather, and were handicapped neither by oceans nor mountains nor distance. Now the critical factor in warfare was time, measured in minutes or seconds. Hawker adjusted his life to this condition. In the past week, he had not slept more than four hours at a stretch. He had trained himself to catnap in his office for 10 or 20 minute periods, after which he felt remarkably refreshed. The engineers who designed the hole had arranged that the commander in chief's command post be on a glass enclosed balcony from which he could see the war room maps and all the activity on the floor below and be surrounded by his staff. In this moment, it wasn't operating like that at all. Hawker had his feet up on the desk in the control room. He was drinking black coffee from a green dine store mug and rapidly reading through a stack of the most important operational and intelligence dispatches. Occasionally, the general fired a question at one or the other of his two colonels, Atkins and Bragg. An A-2 staff sergeant came into the room with two pink flimsies and handed them to Mark Bragg. The general looked up inquiringly. Mark said, from the Eastern Sea Frontier, Patrol planes on the Argentina-Bermuda axis report three unidentified contacts. These skunks are headed for the Atlantic coast. Sounds bad, doesn't it? 
I think this one sounds worse, Mark said. All news service and diplomatic communications between Moscow and the United States have been inoperative for the last hour. This comes from USIA. The news agencies have been calling their Moscow correspondents. All the Moscow operators will say is, sorry, I am unable to complete the call. And there's been no reaction to Latakia from Moscow at all? None, sir. Not a whisper. The general shook his head, slowly, frowning, lines appearing and deepening around the mouth and eyes, his whole face undergoing a transformation, growing older, as if in a few seconds all the strain and fatigue of weeks, months, years had accumulated and were marking his face and bowing his shoulders. Mark said, This is the witching hour, you know. This is the bad one. Their submarines have had a whole night to run in on the coast if that's what they're doing. We're in darkness. They'll soon be in daylight. Dawn is the bad time. What time does it start to get light in New York and Washington? Sunrise on the eastern seaboard is 710 Eastern Standard, Ace Atkins said. Washington's clock read 641. Mark Bragg's mind raced ahead. If an attack came, they could count on no more than 15 minutes warning. If they used every one of those minutes with maximum efficiency, retaliation could be decisive. But Mark feared a minute, or even two, might be lost in necessary communication with Washington. He made a bold proposal. May I suggest, sir, that we ask for the release of our weapons? This was the one mandatory, essential act that must precede the terrible decision to use the weapons. Under the law, the President of the United States owned the nuclear bombs and missile warheads. General Hawker was entrusted with their custody only. Before SAC could use the weapons, the permission of the President or his survivor in a line of succession must be secured. If an attack were underway, that permission would come almost, but not quite, instantly. The General seemed a little startled. Don't you think we can wait, Mark? Yes, sir, we can wait, but if we get it out of the way, it could save us a minute, maybe two. The danger and the necessity of not having a communication snafu must be just as apparent in the Pentagon or the White House or wherever the president is as it is here. What do you think, Ace? Hawker asked. I'd like to have it behind us, sir. The general picked up one of the four phones on Atkins' desk, the phone connecting directly to the Pentagon command post. In this CP, day and night, was a general officer of the Air Force. This duty officer was never out of communication with the President, the Secretary of Defense, and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The general spoke briefly into the phone and then waited, keeping it pressed against his ear. Mark's eye followed the red second hand on the desk clock. This was an interesting experiment. The general said, Yes, John, this is Bob Hawker. I want the release of my weapons. Mark knew that John was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Yes, I'll hold, the general said. The seconds raced away. The general said, thank you, John. It is now 1140 Zulu. You will confirm by teletype? Goodbye, John. The general reached across the desk and wrote in Ace Atkins' log, weapons released to SAC at 1144 Zulu. The operations log was kept in Greenwich time. Mark said, I timed it. One minute and 35 seconds. I hope we don't need it, Hawker said, but I'm glad to have it. The worry lines became less conspicuous around his mouth and eyes. His back and shoulders straightened. Now that the responsibility was his, with communications and entanglements minimized, he accepted it with confidence. His manner said that if it came, he would fight it from here, and by God win it, as much as it could be won. The general poured himself another cup of coffee. Ace Atkins told the general, With your permission, I'm going to scramble 50% of our tankers at Bluey West 1, Thule, Limestone, and Castle. They'll be sitting ducks for missiles from subs. They're right under the gun. They wouldn't get 15 minutes. The general nodded. Ace flipped two keys on the intercom and dictated an order. Beside Ace's desk, a tape recorder steadily turned, monitoring phone calls and conversations. The general glanced at it and said, Do you realize that everything in this room is being recorded for posterity? They all smiled. On all the clocks, another minute flipped. The direct line from NORAD, North American Air Defense, in Colorado Springs, buzzed. Ace picked it up, said, Atkins, SAC Operations. Listened, said, Roger, I repeat, object, maybe missile, fired from Soviet base, and in Peninsular. 
The emergency priority teletype machine from NORAD began to clatter. It's only one, Mark thought. It could be a meteor. It could be a Sputnik. It could be anything. The NORAD line buzzed again. Ace answered and repeated the flash, as before, for the general and the tape recorder. DEW line, high-sensitivity radar, now has four objects on its screen. Speed and trajectory indicates they are ballistic missiles. Presque Isle and Homestead report missiles coming in from sea. We are skipping the yellow. This is your red alert. The general gave an order. Mark rose and said, I think I'd better get back to my desk. The general nodded and smiled thinly. He said, thanks for the 95 seconds.